Uh, hey, this is Peter Mills. I'm the author of The Monkey's Head and the Sixties, and you're listening to Mr. Media. I'm Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You can see, hear, and read more than a thousand of my previous celebrity interviews at mrmedia.com. That's mrmedia.com. Subscribe to the show on YouTube, iTunes, Apple News, Google Play, or Stitcher, and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. On today's show, I'll welcome writer Peter Mills. His new book is The Monkeys, Head and the Sixties. Stick around. There are some truly horrific movies in the history of cinema. I didn't realize until yesterday that one of them starred the monkeys. Davy Jones, Mickey Dolenz, Peter Tork, and Mike Nesmith. Head, a 1968 theatrical release starring the prefab foursome, represents 85 minutes of my life that I will never get back again. Now, what astonishes me is that anyone, not even Jack Nicholson, one of the writers responsible for this legendary atrocity, could make the super charismatic band at all uninteresting. I avoided watching Head for almost 50 years, but finally broke down and watched it for free, fortunately, on YouTube, so I can't complain about spending the money, because I wanted to understand what drove British journalist Peter Mills to write an entire book about the band and the movie. In The Monkeys, Head and the Sixties, Mills dissects the band, the film, and its soundtrack, adding deep cuts of history to the misbegotten cinematic dud. I am old enough to have watched and adored The Monkeys in its original 1966-68 run on NBC. I still have my original Monkeys albums, even the one my baby brother took a bite out of, and I'm going to show you this because nobody ever believes me. So if you're watching the video, check this out. You see that? Can you, can you see that, Peter? I can see it. A, That's a hefty bite. There's. I'll put my hand behind it just so we're clear. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he was my baby brother. He just it's just something he did. But I still have it. It's the original. I bought it at a little mm-hmm. drugstore, which is where we used to have to buy records. So um, I, I I mean. You know, I even interviewed Mickey Dolenz uh, back in the 80s, uh, I think about 1984 mm-hmm. for uh, the St. Petersburg Times. Uh, that was a big highlight for me. So, uh, but I got to say, folks, after this interview, as, as wonderful a guy as I'm sure Peter Mills is, I'm going to try to focus my memories on the TV series and forget I ever saw ahead. <laughs> and with that bizarre intro, Peter, Peter mm-hmm. Mills, welcome to Mr. Media. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Well, I can see I'm going to have to mount a sterling defense of the film here, aren't I? <laughs> what? Yeah. I got to ask, why, why break down a, a little scene, 50-year-old movie uh, that was not particularly admired? It never it never broke out at the box office in its original Certainly run. Not. It hasn't had much of a second life. Um, I guess, so my biggest question is, what drew you to this? I'm fascinated by this part of it. Well, initially, it was the same way that that sort of any young person gets interested in the work of a band who have uh, broken up and dispersed. I mean, pre pre Google, it was kind of a bit hit and miss, you know, finding the material, finding albums you didn't know existed that you hadn't heard of. And I was looking for Monkeys Records because I discovered the Monkeys through the TV show on the repeats uh, on the BBC in the uh, mid 1970s. It was. And one of the the albums that I found was the soundtrack album to Head, and it's I'm sure if if people have seen it they'll they'll remember the the, the cover, the American the U.S. cover was kind of mylar, it was kind of shiny stuff that you get on you know like on kids helium balloons you know that kind of super shiny stuff, uh, but the rest of the world just got a plain white sleeve. So the the English copy that I found just had this plain white sleeve. I was thinking, what's this? very on monkey like cover and then on the back there's a picture of the band and it says you know music from the columbia pictures uh movie head starring the monkeys so that piqued my interest straight away so you know i'd already seen hard day's night and help yellow submarine so i thought well where can i see this thing little did i know it would be about another 15 years before i was able to actually <laughs> track down um a copy on uh, videotape um, so I had a kind of long run up to seeing it. So I was kind of very interested in the monkeys then as now, actually a bit of a lifelong, uh, obsession. I was going to say interest, but obsessions probably, um, it's more accurate and, and more truthful. Um, so I was very keen to see it and the album, um, 
I would say. I don't know if you know the album, Bob, the soundtrack album. Ah, well, you got to check that out, man. I don't think because, so. Because, <laughs> oh, no, no. All right, I'm going to sell it to you, okay, in, in 20 seconds. Um, it stands as a work of art on its own. It only lasts about 35 minutes. And it's extraordinary sort of mixture of the songs from the film, collage, uh, of um, dialogue, little snippets of dialogue, very modern sounding, actually. Hmm. And it was assembled by Jack Nicholson. He actually put the album together. So I, I'm, as I do in the book, I make a strong argument uh, that that's a kind of a work of art in itself. Uh, but the movie, my, my sort of academic interest in the movie, because I, I teach at a university over here in England, and um, one of the modules uh, is called Popular Music and the Moving Image. That's that kind of, so it's like a history of pop on TV, pop in the movies, music video, uh, pop through new media, live performance, etc., etc. And of course, the monkeys kind of fit squarely into certainly the pop on TV bit. And by this time, I'd acquired a copy of Head on video cassette initially, and then the various DVD reissues. I mean, you say it doesn't, it hasn't had much of a second life, but it has become, you know, your actual cult movie now uh peter talk famously said that um in its initial iteration you're absolutely right bob uh it it died a uh it died a death that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy <laughs> that was that was the phrase right. that he used i mean it, he's not exaggerating either i mean it really was sort of box office poison but very very slowly um initially through um the developing reputation of bob rafelson as a you know sort of a director part of the American New Wave. And then gradually as the monkeys uh, work has seen to, has uh, gradually been um, thought, thought about differently because they, they were kind of dismissed a bit, weren't they, at the time? Sure. If you weren't of an age, they were kind of said, oh, it's just kid stuff. Um, but as time has gone by, maybe partly because, you know, the original audience has just got older and then they get into positions of um, cultural authority. I don't know whether that's it. Um, but they've, the work's been reappraised and, well, they're still going, aren't they? Just celebrate the 50th anniversary. So they must be doing something right. Yes, and but I don't think any of it has anything to do with head. Mm, well, I, I don't know about that. I, I don't think... know about it. It's certainly part, I think it's part of the appeal. I think the, the, the range of the output, you know, if you compare it with like the early albums that you were talking about, and, um, you know, your anti Griselda and, you know, all the, those kind of things, which, you know, it's kids pop music, really. I mean, right. it's, it's wonderful, but it's kids music. Um, and then just a couple of years later, after the kind of the little palace revolution that they had, where they took over their uh, own affairs and made that album headquarters that your little brother loved so much, he wanted to <laughs> buy it. So, I mean, what an endorsement that is. Um, and, and then, you know, they kind of, the, the sales were sort of went down, um, but the, the quality of the music kind of rose in a way. And by the time they made Head, the TV series had been cancelled and they were clearly not, you know, the teeny group that they'd been, or the teen friendly group that they'd been two years ago. They're more interested in making a, a kind of countercultural statement on a Hollywood budget, which is what Head is really. Well, but for all its faults. But that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, the the monkeys succeeded all those. Well, the couple of years that they that they were a big thing, mm -hmm. it, based on the the charisma of these four young men, it was. Yeah. I mean, you if I think if uh, Stephen Stills had wound up in the band, as we know, mm -hmm. he he was the original for the Peter Tork role. Um, that's right. It, it might not have worked the same way, but there's something about these four guys. They had a, they they, they saw themselves as. The, they could make fun of themselves. They could make fun of each other. Uh, the music was good, whether it was uh, initially it was Boyce and Hart or it was Neil Diamond, mm. or, you know, whoever it was, uh, Car uh, Carol, uh, Carol King and Jerry Goffin. Right. Uh, yeah. But they took apart what they were in this movie. It, it was almost like I, I was going to I wanted to ask you, I mean, do you think Jack Nicholson just hated the idea of the monkeys and the, the commercialization of pop. It just seemed like he, went in, in writing, in his part in writing the script and Bob Rafelson's part, it seems like they wanted to destroy what they had rather than, I mean, today we would look at it and go, you, if you wanted to make a protest film with something like this, 
you would still make it funny. You would mm-hmm. still give it the elements of what it had, and then you would go kind of guerrilla with it at the same time. But you would still look. For, you would still look for, for for songs that were good quality songs that you know fit. You would. But I mean, we have the the that horrible image of the of, of uh, the the child or the, the man being shot in Vietnam. And, yeah, and all the, the the war stuff, and it just it didn't. I don't think it it didn't work. I mean, it just didn't work. And and you took these four very charismatic fellows who were at different times in the movie. They they show glimpses of that. Even when they're saying, even when they're acknowledging that they're prefab pop and, when, and that they're they're an invention or that they're this or that you know what you see is not what you get fine you know but it just wasn't funny and it wasn't particularly clever it didn't it just didn't seem to work mm. well oh no where to begin <laughs> um well it, it, it's absolutely true that that they colluded in the the destruction of their own public image i mean it's no accident that the film begins and ends with them jumping off um the Gerald Douglas Bridge at, at Long Beach. You know, I mean, one of the one of the several working titles uh, of the movie was "The Monkeys Commit Suicide." Uh, it's it's so that that idea of just kind of taking apart their public image was central to it. Um, but the monkeys were the experience of being in the monkeys and the whole. If you look at the, the the story of the monkeys over the just over those three years really that they they were going that they had any commercial traction, although they carried on for a little bit longer um, into early 1970, um, they were kind of born out of extremity. Everything was extreme. Everything was full on, going from you know Peter Tork washing pots in you know in a diner, and Bob Rafelson going to go to find him because Stephen Stills, as you rightly say. Uh, said, well, if you you know if you don't want me, go and get this 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 friend of mine who kind of looks a bit like me and may, he's a bit funnier than I am. Maybe he's what, who you're after. So to go from pot washing to being you know part of the most successful pot project on the planet in about six months, you know that's that's extreme. And then the global success through the television, and then this strange transformation into a it would take quote unquote real band through public demand, you know, having to go out and do concerts and stuff. Um, and then having to fight, having to sort of assert themselves into existence with headquarters and Pisces Aquarius um, and a couple of albums that followed that. Um, so I think that the, the extremity, which you rightly identify in the movie um, and it's, it's continual. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of an assault on the senses in a way. I mean, if we've got time, I'll come back to that. Um, but I, I would say that's kind of born out of what it was like to be around the monkeys, to be in the monkeys or to be around the monkeys. Uh, everything happened fast. Everything happened, you know, absolutely at jet speed. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you weren't looking, you'd miss it. I mean, heads like that, isn't it? If you're not looking you'll miss it. Sometimes that's all right because something's horrible or something's boring and it's all right because in a minute there'll be another scene. But, you know, the speed of it and the um, the sort of the visual non secateurs between the scenes, I think anyway, is, is, is kind of deliberate. It, it's, a, it's sort of a composite to show what it was like to be around the success of a project like The Monkeys. I think so anyway. But, you know, I know unlike the, the awful... Uh, Vietnam footage uh, that crops up three, maybe even four or five times in the movie. We shouldn't forget they could have been th- those images could have been taken from that evening's news. So you know it was it was uh, right. a kind of co- collision of showbiz and reality. Oh, I wasn't turned off by the imagery uh, being part of the error. I was turned off mm. because it just didn't seem to fit uh, mm. anything else that was going on. So let me let me ask you this. Um, you in this in the book and the book is extremely well written i don't want to take anything away from the book oh thank you i, I mean i read the book and, and it i'm a i'm a monkeys fan i wanted to know you know but um you spent about a hundred pages in the book 
breaking down the script for head. Mm. You, you take, yeah. I, I should tell people, you take time at the beginning and you talk about the era of the 60s. You, you, you introduce us to each of the monkeys. You tell us a bit about their backstory. There's things that I've read, you know, that I had not read before about the monkeys. And I like to think that I know that, that whole uh, story pretty oh, well. Right. But, but yeah, it was, I mean, it's very, very interesting, very well told. And you break down the script and the film itself over about a hundred pages, which is, you know, there's, there's chapter, 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 and then a hundred pages on the movie and then chapter. chapter. So mm. what I'm curious is how many times did, did you have to watch the movie to do that? And, um, did your opinion of the film, uh, did it, it did it get better with repeated viewing? Did you, you know, are, are you, I don't know what, you know, what kept driving you to keep looking at it? Sure. Well, I mean, in, in, in the wider sense, the reason that I wrote the book was because um, I kept waiting for somebody to, to write a book about the monkeys that addressed head, hmm. because there are some, some wonderful books out about the monkeys, chronological ones, fan ones, books by Davy and Mickey themselves. Um, but they all seem to sort of skirt round head, really. Not, not because, I don't think because people wanted to pretend it didn't exist or because they were embarrassed by its failure, but because it's so, it, you know, it's like the old riddle wrapped in an enigma inside a mystery sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's, it's something to take on a film like that. So um, the fact that nobody had done it and the fact that I had this sort of frankly unusual level of interest in it <laughs> made me think, well, you know, I'm going to have to do this thing. So, you know, I, I got the commission from Jawbone Books, uh, New York and London, and um, got the green light. Uh, up to that point, I'd shown head to my students every year for maybe 10 years, I think. How long have I been there now? Probably about 10 years. And I'd seen it maybe half a dozen times before that. So even before I started writing the book, I must have seen the film about 25 times. Mm. So this is what I'm recommending to you, Bob, right? Don't go on one time, son. Not going to happen. Two dozen times to go, then we can have a conversation. Not going to happen. <laughs> Listen, I, 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 I'll tell you, you don't know. I mean, I studied film. That's My degree is in film. Ah, okay. I love film. I, 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 you know, I would go to, uh, when, I, when I was growing up, there was a 99-cent uh, theater in New Jersey uh, uh -huh. where I would go, I would ride my bicycle. It was about a... It was about a 10 mile in each direction ride. Wow. I would ride my bicycle there. And, and they had multiple films during the course of a day, something the theaters don't do anymore, uh, at least here. And I would sit and I would watch whatever they put up. Uh, uh, 99 cents to see this horrible Monty Python esque film, Jabberwocky. 90, oh, I remember uh, that. 99 yeah. cents yeah. to see, you know, like the last film that that uh, Orson Welles did. I mean, whatever it was, just horrible, horrible movies. I mean, I understand the um, the fascination with with t dissecting a bad movie or an ill thought of movie like uh, Plan Nine from Outer Space, the Ed Wood Ooh. film, or you know, there's a lot of them out there. I was just, I was, I was, I was really hoping because uh, I read the book first and then watched the movie, and I was thinking, okay, wow, I I want to see this movie now. But then I watched it and I went. Yeah, I really wish I could erase that from my memory banks. It's just I love those guys. I mean, and what's interesting is, uh, folks, if you uh, if you see it, you can watch the whole movie for free at least at the moment on YouTube. Yeah. And the way it works on YouTube now, it, it, depending on how your your browser is set up, it will play that, and then to the right, it'll show you related uh, shorts and videos that you can see. I saw a whole bunch of documentaries, including a thirty minute documentary with Bob Rafelson. On head, yeah, which I actually one. found more interesting than the movie itself, <laughs> you know, as he talked about it and you got his perspective. Yeah. Um, but uh, and then there were a lot of interviews with monkeys and a lot of stuff that I just never unearthed before. Um, but I just couldn't, uh, I just didn't buy the movie. Is um, despite mm. all of your, your, you know, your your wonderful uh, uh, writing and uh, research, the research is fascinating. Everything I learned about them. I was fascinated with. I'm always fascinated with, but right. I just didn't. Um, I just didn't uh, buy me. Oh, and by the way, listen. Uh, for people who are watching this on video, there's the monkeys' headquarters. There's the monkeys. Mm -hmm. There's more of the monkeys. There's the birds and the bees the and the bees. monkeys. Oh, there's my partridge family <laughs> album. Look, we've even got the banana oh, splits. Fantastic. Everything's Archie, 
and then and now the best of the monkeys. I think this is I think this is when I uh, interviewed Mickey a few years ago. So okay. I mean I'm I, you know I, I I'm that guy I'm that that mm-hmm. guy of a certain middle age who you know really really is fond of the band and but so let's let, let's let's change gears a little bit. Let's talk about Jack Nicholson. I mean, Ooh. I'm sure people are very surprised when they when they find out that Nicholson, uh, and he, he there's a little walk on part where we actually see him. Yeah, he and De- uh, Dennis Hopper just appear just for a moment. Right. Yeah. Um, how weird is it that Jack Nicholson was in this, and and how did this affect his career? Do you think in at that point? Well, I guess he probably thought it was just kind of um, a, a smallish thing at the time, because uh, Nicholson was you know he was on the scene. He'd slightly worn a rut in kind of sort of schlocky movies that he'd been doing. And um, he had a bit of form in the psychedelic field as well, of course, through The Trip and Psych Out, which came out the same year as Head. In fact, um, if people know the the, the film, or, and you no doubt recall, Bob, from, from seeing it recently, the Timothy Leary character, this sort of monstrous figure who struts about the set and pops up periodically and sort of terrifies everybody that was that was originally uh, written for bruce dern because he was he was friends with uh, Nick nicholson and they both appeared in psych out um but nicholson um was friend with with rafelson and rafelson clearly thought that um nicholson could do the job script wise that you know he had that kind of mixture of uh, sort of sly countercultural element to it, but also had enough of the um, uh, the iconoclastic element in him uh, to you know to to do the job that Rafelson wanted the movie to do really, as far as the brand of the monkeys went. And um, of course, Easy Rider was was financed actually by monkeys money. Mm. I mean, it came came through Rafelson, and although Dennis Hopper directed it, obviously. Um, but it, it, so in a way, you can say that the monkeys and head kind of kickstarted the American new wave in terms of, you know, the kind of the early 70s sort of reinvention of American cinema. Well, I, I, and so that that sorry, sorry, Bob, no, yeah. please. No, I'll just say so that's how Nicholson kind of got on board, really, because he was kind of in the right place at the right time. But he was also the right stuff for the project. Well, and, and people who write off the monkeys as being just, you know, claptrap. Mm. miss and, and think that there was just this tv invention okay mm. there's nicholson was involved in the movie uh we know that uh, mickey spent time got to know uh, lennon mccartney was treated very mm. respectfully by them peter yeah. tour friendly with uh, Stephen stills I, I imagine they're still friends uh you know i don't know how, how close they are but at the time i mean stills got him the gig uh the, you know these four guys they they had reputations of their own they were they were they were well thought of it, you know whatever you know was going on there with the with the music and doing a tv sitcom um yeah it was, it's interesting i i wish that they had done something just a little bit different there's so much i mean the people in the 60s didn't enjoy this movie that was very 60s uh, mm. you know <laughs> and and you know there mm. the different generations do grab hold of different pop yes. culture um yes you mentioned before that you show this in a class that you teach every year. Mm. I'm curious, what is the name of the class, and what other films do you show in the class? Well, the the name of the class is uh, it's, it's a, a, a course, um, the popular music and the moving image. Um, and usually, I only I only show Head, not because there aren't 50 other films I could show them, but um, by and large, it's hard enough to get them to come and pay attention to a single film rather than a whole season of them but in the past i've shown things like performance and this is spinal tap and stop making sense and um was performance was that mick jagger um uh, i beg your pardon yeah yeah performance i, I meant privilege actually oh I the, the peter one. watkins thing oh with, with paul jones it's 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 kind of a like dystopian Thing. Very, very British, yeah. very British, mid sixties. <laughs> but Paul Jones, just after he left Manfred Mann, plays oh. the plays plays the lead. So oh. It's a great film. I think maybe you'd enjoy it. I, I will make um, a note of that. I will look for that. Yeah, I will not watch Head again, but I will look for no, that. No, okay, all right, that's the deal. That's See, the I have deal. an open mind. <laughs> no, just... I don't doubt it for one second. Yeah, no, no, it's, just... it's 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 no, it is very difficult. I mean, 
it's uh, when when I show it to the students, usually it's about 80 percent people uh, of the students come out thinking, well, what was that? <laughs> um, and two or three will say, that was amazing. Where can I find out more about it? And two or three either leave halfway through because they can't stand it or they're in tears or, or something. You know, so and I think all three kind, you know, the full range of responses is, is entirely appropriate because it, it's an unusual film. It's unusual in its content, you know, the episodic content, which is not unlike the, the TV show in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, one minute they'll be doing one thing and then as if by magic, something else is happening. So there's that kind of um, that kind of sort of non or sort of um, counterintuitive narrative thing going on. Uh, so you'll get those kind of juxtapositions. Um, and there's some sort of little, very interesting little cultural moments in there. You Perhaps you remember the bit where there's a bit of channel surfing going on. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's really, yeah, do you remember? And, and it turns out it's Victor Mature's hand. Oh, my God, that's so flicking. bizarre. It's so bizarre. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And those juxtapositions, you know, it's an advert, it's a scene from Vietnam, it's a cartoon, it's a second-hand car salesman, it's Walter Cronkite, it's a, you know, those kind of juxtapositions are kind of interesting and they're, they're very novel for the time, I think. Uh, there is a, there is a, I don't know if you call it a walk-on, there's a scene where they're on a Hollywood backlot late in the movie where there's a lot of stuff going on mm. and there is a woman in a Dream of Genie uh, harem costume now, oh yeah right so but it's not barbara eden but it was clearly barbara eden's costume and i just wondered if did i did i miss something in the book about that or did you know anything about that i thought that was rather interesting no well you have just proved a point about head bob so it doesn't matter how many pages you spend <laughs> on it you always miss something <laughs> so there you go so, so yeah. I, I i didn't i know you okay. didn't miss anything i just didn't write about it oh okay all I'm right. going to confess to that one. All right, all right. See, but I did pay attention both in the <laughs> yeah, book, in yeah, the, clearly in the book and the movie. Uh, yeah, that was surprising. I mean, they were both N uh, the monkeys and I Dream of Genie were both mm -hmm. NBC shows, yeah. and uh, you know there were other things that were. But I thought well, that's odd. Why? Why somebody dressed as Barbara Eden's character? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, well, well, I the mon the monkeys did kind of supersede I Dream of Genie, mm. so there might have been some comments about that. You know, in the the slot. It, it took over oh, it the, the genie slot. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so maybe, okay. maybe that's that. Maybe there was some reference there, or maybe the they just fancied using it. I Interesting. Don't know. Um, yeah. So, um, do your kids, uh, your kids? I'm sorry. You know, we're both of a certain age. The students in your classes. And by the way, mm. I I look. Uh, you teach at Leeds Beckett University, correct? That's right. Yes. All right. Let's, yes. So, so if anyone's watching and is curious to you know look into the course. I just want them to know where, where it's being taught. Uh, do they yeah, actually right. know who the monkeys are? Or are they coming to it kind of you know raw in terms of okay, this is an we're going to watch a film and uh, something called something called the monkeys. But I mean, it's been fifty years. Kids yeah. can be excused yeah. if they don't know who the monkeys are at this point. No, absolutely right. And usually they don't. I mean, uh, in every year there there are maybe one or two kids who are already experts. Mm. So like for example, um, two or three weeks ago. Uh, I was I just I just happened to mention television, the, the you know, Marky Moon adventure, that, that that group, the American group. And I was saying, oh, probably probably the best group to come out of the, the New York sort of so-called punk scene. And this, this kind of 18 year old kid comes up to me afterwards and says, no, I disagree. I think the modern lovers were better. <laughs> so, you know, every year there'll be one of those. And you think, where have you got this information from? It's fantastic. Um, and likewise, there's usually a couple of them who at least recognize the monkeys. Mm. Or if you give them a little bit of a nudge, I'm a believer, last train to Clarksville, you know, the, the famous ones. So, oh, yes, I've heard those. Or, you know, my parents have got those. So this kind of thing. Mm. But um, they're always very open to it. And what they also understand is um, that there was a process which kind of uh, was, was brought into being um, with the monkeys and, and proved itself to be successful, which is kind of ongoing. You know, the idea of, of, of casting for success, how an act can be kind of put together mm -hmm. um, to meet a market demand. And they understand that very well because, of course, it, you know, it's still happening with things like American Idol 
and uh, X Factor in this country. Um, so that process, they're absolutely familiar with that. And they, they have less of a problem with that than perhaps people did, you know, 50 years ago. Because their, their idea of what, you know, the authentic in music is, is different. You know, to them, do I like it or not is the question. Not, well, have they paid their dues or not? Right. right. Yeah, so so there's, they, they, they do come at it slightly differently in that way. Right. But, um, my you know, I guess... They get browbeaten by my enthusiastic advocacy, and so they, you know, and then they take it on board. and And they're very bright kids, and they're very interested in the history of popular culture. And I think that the monkeys are very, very important to the history of popular culture. And music, this, film, TV. On this, we completely agree. Yeah. I, I, yeah. No argument from me about that. Um, yeah. So, so Peter, what's uh, what's next for you? Are you going to tackle? Uh, are you going to do another book with another? You're going to slice up another piece of pop culture? Is something different? Uh, what's uh... well? Well, there's there's a there's a couple of things really, Bob. Um, the um, I should say this actually, and then the world can breathe a sigh of relief. The original manuscript of this book was nearly twice as long as the one that got published. <laughs> yeah, I so think if you thought you mentioned that in the introduction, don't you? Uh, probably, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I thought, so we wow! Had to a lot, so, yeah. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so we thought a hundred page, a hundred pages. That was the edited version. Um, God. So maybe, maybe if anybody's interested, I might sort of do something with that because there was a lot more on the music. Actually, most of the movie stuff went in, but there was a lot more about the music, which, which you know, I had to set aside for reasons of space. So I might do something with that if 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 people are interested. Um, Sounds like a blog uh, to me. You think? Oh, absolutely! Sounds like a a wonderful blog that would just uh, you know complement the uh, the book. That is a brilliant idea, actually. Yeah, I'm going to write that down. Please. I said that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Hopefully, Bob. that'll make up for my uh, being kind of <laughs> dubious about the movie. <laughs> oh no, no, it's fantastic. I mean, it's 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 entirely you know the, it's the correct response, really. You know, I mean, I I don't I don't know how anybody could watch that that film once and you know, get it or think, oh, that was the greatest movie I've ever seen or anything like that. You know, it, it it's like Finnegan's Wake or something. You know, going to go back into it and back into it and back right. into it and slowly it reveals itself. I did like, I, I have to admit, I did like the vacuum cleaner scene. I don't know why, <laughs> but that was because it seemed like something that would come out of the TV series. It, yeah, you know, absolutely. It, it, it yeah. worked. Uh, so yeah. uh, uh, not working on another book at the moment? Well, I'm... Um, um, if I don't do the monkeys thing, it's a, a slight sort of a slight difference. Um, somebody has asked me to do a book on popular music and the Cold War, the role of popular music in uh, during the Cold War. Oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah, so that that's another kind of little interest of mine. So okay. that's a possibility. Cool. Well, uh, folks, listen. You can find Peter Mills' new book, The Monkeys Head and the Sixties, at great bookstores anywhere, or you can order it uh, and. Uh, right here at a great price at mrmedia.com uh if you look if you're watching on mrmedia.com and i know you could be seeing it on itunes or uh, stitcher or anywhere else but if you're if you're watching the video on uh, mrmedia.com just below the the video itself you'll see the cover of the book you can click on it uh and uh you can order the uh, the ebook version have it instantly downloaded to your e-reader or you can have the paperback version uh sent to you within a day or two uh, or if you're within uh, Amazon, maybe you can get it 30 minutes by drone. I don't know. You know, <laughs> By the time you get this, who knows what's possible. Um, so, uh, Peter, do you have a website? Are you in social media? Can people find you anywhere? Um, they can find me on Twitter, uh, P-E-M-33-R-P-M. That's how it goes. All right. Very good. Um, but, but that's it. I don't, I'm not much of a social media uh, gadfly, but I am on Twitter. So it's P-E-M-33-R-P-M. Excellent. Well, I, you know, I got to say, I enjoyed reading the book. It's fa- it's absolutely fascinating reading, um, and I know that other people will and do enjoy the, the movie itself. I'm just expressing the opinion of one man. But um, mm-hmm. Peter, I, I'm delighted to uh, talk to you. I, I hope that uh, if you if you do another book, you'll come back and uh, thank I'd you. Love so, to. Thank you so much for joining us, in Mr. Media, today. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks very much, Bob. Turn up now the stereo receiver 
to believe her A bad idea to believe her Turn up the stereo receiver Turn up the stereo receiver Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience full of teeny boppers daydreaming of meeting Davy Jones in the next life in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Poor Davy. Poor Davy. Poor Davy. Yeah. Hi, this is Rich Scheidner. If you've ever wondered what it was like to be a stand up comedian in the 1980s, I'm going to do you a big favor. Instead of billions of dollars for a time machine, you can just spend $24.95 and buy my new book, Kicking Through the Ashes, My Life as a Stand-Up in the 1980s Comedy Boom. It will save you money and give you thrills. It will take you there. Go to my website, richscheidner.com. Go to amazon.com and buy this book. <laughs>